Hello and welcome to News Click and to the second part of our show where we look at how 2020 has been as far as international issues are concerned, as far as global geopolitics is concerned. In the first episode that was yesterday, we took a look at the economic developments and the tech war, so to speak, as well as the emerging, the decline of the US and the Sino-Russian alliance. And in today's uh, episode, we're going to be taking a look at the military aspects, the strategic aspects, as well as uh, issues that could actually put humanity at a whole as, at risk. We are with us, Prabir Prakasa. Thank you, Prabir, for joining us. Prabir, so I want to start out with a larger look at the state of disarmament itself. And the past few years have not really been good on this count. You've seen the US, of course, withdrawing from deals, the INF Treaty, of course. The new start is still in a bit of a conundrum, so to speak, the US attitude towards it has been very negative. Now, some of this might change once the Biden administration takes over, but the general consensus has been that we are very close to the possibility of an apocalyptic war. So how do you see the situation right now? I don't know whether we are closer to an apocalyptic war that can end humanity, but it is also true according, according to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and the Doomsday Clock, uh, what they put out, that we are the closest we've ever been to a nuclear exchange and extinction of human civilization. It's not based on the fact that countries are doing saber rattling or at each other's throat, but the fact that all the arms treaties have collapsed and we are looking at the last arms treaty left, which is what is called the new start. And that itself under Trump didn't look like there was any possibility of its being renewed. Under the Biden administration, we don't know. You might see a one-year you know, uh, extension of the treaty, hoping that in this one year they could work out something. So we don't know about that. It's also possible that the US will continue what Trump administration had argued, that we need to bring China in. But well, China's, uh, as you know, its uh, number of nuclear weapons is less than that of France, for example. So the logic of bringing China in is not clear. Now, the United States is also, not only vis-a-vis -vis the new start, when it withdrew from the intermediate nu uh, nuclear design treaty, that at that point of time, it had said that they are doing it also because of China. Now, China has, according to it, intermediate range missiles. Again, they have never substantiated this. And if you really look at what they have said, while all this has been rhetoric, what they have said is that we need to have the ability to control China's coastline as well. And the fact that China has its ability to control its near borders, that itself is a threat to the, U the US ability to dominate over all theaters of earth, war, which is basically its military or strategic doctrine. So this, the thrust re-China has not been so much as China has got certain abilities which threatens the United States. But what it is saying is its ability to control its near uh, sea borders or oceans or seas, all of that put together, is itself something that it would not like because it means losing in that belt the parity, uh, reaching parity with China, which they don't want. Now, you know, it's very strange because after all, there is a huge Pacific Ocean in between to the fact that China is not allowed to control even its coastal uh, seas is a bit of a problem. And this is where its South China Sea issue comes up that it's trying to align with uh, Chinese neighbors. And at one point of time, they were willing to play the US game, but it doesn't seem that they are willing to play that game anymore. And if we look at trade relations, it's also interesting, even Japan, who has tensions with China on a lot of these issues, including South China Sea, is not willing to break off trade relations with, the, with China. On the contrary, they have actually signed also be, become a part of the RCEP trade agreement. So I think there are lots of issues there which we need to think about. But the issue that is the dominant one in the question that you've asked, are we going to see a return to a nuclear understanding and also stepping up the disarmament uh, policies that had been initiated under Ronald Reagan, who's not exactly a peaceable peacenik. Uh, you can talk that about, say, maybe Carter, maybe, but who himself on the Middle East was quite a hawk. 
but the, certainly Reagan, who started the Stars Wars initiative, was no peacenik. But he admitted that nuclear war was not winnable. And that's how the start, the SALT agreement took place, and then the start, and then the new start. So the question is that are we going to see a return to ratcheting down the number of nuclear weapons that countries have? Obviously, uh, United States and Russia have much, much more uh, than any other country. And uh, they nearly have, I think, more than 90% of the world's stock of nuclear weapons at this point. So that is the crucial issue. And whether we will see ratcheting down those number of warheads or not, that still remains something that we see no, no movement on that count. What we are seeing is, can it the current freeze be maintained? That's what we are talking about when you start. On the other side, we also have hypersonic missiles being developed because Russia feels that the kind of batteries, missile batteries that has been put on its borders is a threat to its, internal, to its security because it can wipe out Russia's offensive capabilities and also a second strike possibility can be then precluded by virtue of what are called anti-missile shields that are being put on its borders. So it has reacted by saying, okay, if you are trying to see that you get nuclear dominance over me, then I have to respond by developing certain other kinds of missiles. And the hypersonic missiles are in that category. And there have been a set of series of missiles that Putin talked about, but the hypersonic missiles are quite real. And now we have a hypersonic missile race, the Russians, the Americans, and also the Chinese joining force. And even the Indians have said they're also on the path of developing hypersonic missiles. So all of this makes this danger of nuclear war and nuclear exchange incrementally more likely. Right. And once you don't see a strong peace movement, which is what we saw in the 80s, 90s, there was a strong peace movement which protested against the intermediate range missiles, the neutron bomb being put in Europe, Europe becoming the uh, war ground uh, in, the, in exchanges between Russia and the United States. That is no longer there. And the biggest problem today is not just the fact that both sides are inching towards, uh, again, a nuclear arms race. Of course, primarily uh, led by the United States in this case, walking out of various nuclear restraint regime treaties, but also the fact that we lack a peace movement in the world today. And therefore, the voice that should really count in the people against such weapons and weaponization of even space, that is the element that is missing. And that's what makes the situation much more dangerous because you have a few uh, war warriors, nuclear warriors, space warriors, sitting in various places, dictating the policies without any resistance or any public debate. Because when it comes to strategic uh, or war issues, then generally, unless there is a peace movement, people don't want to raise their heads. And I think that's the bigger danger we have. And that's why the nuclear race or a renewal of nuclear race is, is going to be dangerous. Biden may not immediately abandon New START. That is true. But will Biden say we will not rebuild our nuclear weapons that we had in fact, Obama started this modernizing the nuclear weapons. Right. Trump has uh, talked about it. Uh, budget has been put to it. So what are we really going to see still remains a question. And I don't think Biden is by any means a revolutionary on this count. But hey, if Ronald Reagan could go down the piece of path, maybe Biden will. We don't know. We'd Absolutely. like to be surprised. And in this context, of course, there's the uh, move in the other direction where, again, over the year, we have seen repeated instances of very basic or small equipment being able to make a considerable difference in military fortunes. And one example, of course, was the fact that uh, the, Azer uh, the Azeris in the war with the conflict with Armenia were able to use drones successfully. Even in the previous year, we saw how the Houthis were able to sort of, uh, say, use this technology to actually take, go take on the much more powerful Saudi air regime as well. So in that sense, there's also the, a small sense of a military stalemate appearing in key uh, regions, for instance, especially in West Asia, where despite not being numerically stronger or 
stronger in terms of equipment nonetheless uh, forces say countries like iran for instance or the houthis have that element of being able to mount resistance you know the azeri armenian uh, war should be put on a separate plane because this is a this was a surprise to the armenians that their forces could be taken out by the drone strikes that the azeris uh, had done now of course that means that it is possible to introduce a new element of warfare which is the drones to what would be called conventional forces so that's one part of it and that's something which i think every army will uh, now take into account that how do we protect ourselves against such assaults how do you protect our tanks how do you protect our arms uh, guns and so on so there is i think an element of newness that has been introduced and we can relate it to the ban that the united states has now imposed on the uh, chinese drones for example which are really which may appear to be do it yourself drones but the technology of that is not very different from what you see in terms of the drone strikes that were done on aramco for example by the houthis so this is something that we need to now take into account that drones are going to change the nature of warfare on on the azeri uh, armenian issue i would just take a pass on that for today but looking at what it means for instance the saudi arabians what it means for the us forces in west asia it means that much smaller players had have an ability to hit and cause damage to much stronger powers so it's not that the saudi arabians are not much stronger than the houthis they indeed are but the point is the ability of the houthis to use almost the do it yourself drones to configure them in a way that they could actually uh, cause a considerable amount of damage to aramco i think that is something to think about that it means that you have to resolve differences not militarily but through negotiations and through an understanding secondly instead of buying just arms or inviting united states and nato powers into your region you have to do this regionally and even that's true for albania and azerbaijan it's really regional powers which have to come together and resolve these issues instead of calling the overlord of the world which is essentially the united states to come and solve all the problems solved within courts as you know it is not an even handed or an uninterested uh, judge it's really coming out in favor of israel favor of saudi arabia in the most regressive regimes in the region and so on so i think this uh, what you call the drone warfare has produced something of a, a stalemate in terms of much stronger powers being able to dictate terms to weaker powers and i think the classic example of that is israel versus hezbollah hezbollah has enough firepower now to make israel cautious about whether it can invade lebanon again or not the last invasion didn't go well for israel because hezbollah was able to stop them 2 to 2 and a half kilometers from the borders which none of the arab countries had succeeded earlier so that was one but now they also have enough firepower to have strikes within israel and of course drones are or intelligent missiles are a part of that ability so i think this has led to a kind of strategic parity between uneven military powers and essentially therefore offensive capabilities are not simply the amount of money that you have and how much arms you buy abroad i think that's the uh, immediate consequence will this state last we don't know what we do see is much more regional talks about peace and i will say even if the initiative of the monarchies with israel i'd put in that that account that now okay let's regionally see we can solve the issues though of course it is under the tutelage of the united states but nevertheless there is this issue that we need to solve the regional issues with regional powers will it see its extension into turkey greece the issue about uh, the pipeline uh, or through the mediterranean 
will that be under such regional auspices or will it be nato trying to intervene and dictate to turkey though nato uh, turkey is a nato member will it also mean that iran azerbaijan armenia turkey will sit together and solve the problem of nagorno karabakh i think those are the kind of issues that we are seeing and i do believe that we are in a path of more regional play taking place and not everything being subsumed under international tensions this is not to united states liking they would like to be involved in every place as the power which decides for each of these countries what the right course should be and the right course should be those who are allies of the united states are always right as you know so i think that is not going to work at least in the medium term as it appears were given the kind of changes that have taken place as you rightly said based on the ability of using drones let's not forget you can also have underwater drones mm -hmm. so shipping shipping could also be affected so we have all kinds of possibility and that's the perhaps the reason why the chinese toy manufacturers do it yourself drones uh, have been have come under sanctions and finally prabir so we talked of course about the land and the seas but now it definitely space becoming the new frontier as far as weaponization is concerned even maybe as far as arms race is concerned and the us once again of course uh, definitely taking the lead there they even announced the logo of the space force and given a name they're going to be called guardians the officials of the space force at least but how do we see this arms race in space at least developing over the next couple of years and is there a possibility of reining it in any by any chance you know we had an agreement Uh, about not weaponizing space so us talking about space command by itself may not violate that uh, agreement but what happens is what the space command is showing putting laser guns in the uh, in the space firing at things on the, on the ground destroying arms on the ground and so on these of course means also not only weaponizing space but also probably mounting nuclear devices in space to power this kind of weapons so you are talking about both extending nuclear weapons to space or at least nuclear fissile devices to space and also offensive weapons in space you see it's not that the space is not militarized because after all you have military satellites in space so it is in that sense militarized but that is different from putting weapons in space which is where the main objection was and that was something which all countries had agreed should not be done so that is really the violation of the space agreement that we see and now the united states has also said that commercially it can mine any part of the uh, any part of space now whether it's economically useful today or 200 years later we're not getting into that but under again an agreement which all countries seem to have done earlier it is that we will not have commercial exploitation of space by any country but the united states has said, has said no <clears throat> it is universal human kinds uh, heritage resources that we agree but commercially anybody who goes there can do it and there's no bar to that so again it boils down to how do you interpret the language of the treaties how do you interpret any of these things but the fundamental issue is do you really want to start a arms race in this, in space do you really want to start a commercial uh, race for the space the way for instance the marine empires came out mm -hmm. assuming that the, uh, the land belonged to anybody who reached there and planted their flag i think it used to be called for god and country the church also gave its imprimatur to the colonizing face right. of western european countries so is that something we want to repeat in the 21st century is the question and i think unfortunately the us as always has taken a position that it is for i don't know about god it is for definitely for their country that they are going to go anywhere in the world and i think that also is one of the uh, un unfortunate results of the last this day this i will not say this year it's really the last two decades but since we are discussing 
20, the end of 2020, I think we should really talk about this 20 years, what are we seeing? And I think that unfortunately, the shift here too is very dangerous. Thank you so much, Parvi, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.